You might think the boy is as put together like a lot of other superhero shows. Green screen, CGI, an army of effects artists, and it is. But we're fairly certain the effects crew on Smallville never asked for a blood-covered dick the size of a small house. Homelander and Queen Maeve's first scene shows them flexing their might in the same way you might see in a Marvel project. But unlike every single ugly ass frame of Quantum Mania, I feel like I'm hugging Godzilla. The scene actually utilizes practical effects to accompany the CGI. You better believe this is a call out, Kevin. The scene of Queen Maeve going stiff to stop an armored truck was mostly made with practical effects. The crew used wires to drag the truck into a big metal pole, instead of, you know, driving a car into their actress. They also captured a shot of Dominique McElligot jumping in front of a green screen. The two were then combined to make it look like she was the one turning the truck into tinfoil. To make it look like Queen Maeve was actually inside the truck as debris flew around her, the team built a special set. The whole rig was on wheels, allowing it to be moved around the actress as a fan blew on it. Once every everything was put together and debris was added with CGI, the sequence looked less like vehicular manslaughter and more like a superhero doing her job. In real life New York, standing on the edge of a curb means that you might get hit by a cyclist or the corner of a bus. In the New York of the boys, it means you might be instantly vaporized by a speedster high on super drugs. So it's more like LA. My deepest condolences to Robin Ward's family. If Robins never turned into human spaghetti sauce, The Boys would be a show about a reasonably happy retail worker living in a world that's slightly more interesting than our own. I'd like to make an appointment for you to come over and lay some cable. In order to get a beautifully dynamic look at the worst day of Huey's life, the scene was filmed in front of a green screen with a phantom high-speed camera at about 500 frames per second. For non-film geeks, that's real slow. The crew positioned the camera on a big robotic arm so they could move the camera quickly enough to get the perfect shot of actor Jack Quaid looking like he's front row at a Guar concert. Visual effects supervisor Stephen Fleet told VFX Voice, What you're seeing there when it's rounding around Huey is one second of time being slowed down. As for Robin's disintegrated body and the blood splattered on Huey, the team made a valiant effort to use practical effects. Kevin Feige! But the result didn't quite look the way they wanted. They ended up using CGI rather than dumping a bucket of blood on Quaid like he'd just been crowned prom queen. That meant that the final decision the team made was exactly what the reign of gore should look like, as Fleet put it. How much of Robin do we see? How much of her guts do we see? How much blood do we see? What's the trajectory? It became about the storytelling. So basically, the VFX team behind the boys is Dexter Morgan. Look at the blood spatter, look at the patterns. It tells a story. Fleet also admitted, there's probably more blood than a real human would have, but it would be a lot less interesting if it was a real situation. Well, yeah, if it was a real situation, Huey would just be stuck with recurring nightmares and lifelong therapy bills. As the defender of the seas and a bootleg Aquaman, the Deep loves all the animals that call the water their home. He really loves them, like biblically speaking. Despite his best efforts though, the Deep's relationships often end in tragedy. He's watched several of his marine buddies die in horrific fashion, like that time in season three when Homelander forced him to eat his octopus buddy Tim. Wasn't that delicious? Before that though, the Deep made a splash in season 1 when he got his dolphin lover killed during a botched aquarium escape. Dolphins are the ocean's assholes in general, but this one in particular was kind of a sex pest. Okay, okay, if I just touch it, will you shut up? When the cops surround the Deep's truck, he hits the brakes, flinging the horny mammal through the windshield like it's an aquatic final destination. A passing truck then finishes the job by notching what might be the first recorded case of dolphin roadkill. <laughs> Since production didn't have a bunch of disposable dolphins lying around, what are they, SeaWorld? The boys used the next best thing, puppets and CGI. For the crash, the team built a green dolphin doll, as well as a special device to throw it into traffic like a giant batting cage for sea life, as Stephen Fleet put it. It was kind of one of those funny nights in visual effects. You know, you're working until 5 in the morning, launching green dolphins out of a car. Been there, Stephen. Been there. Soho VFX later replaced the Green Dolphin with a CG version that looked more like the real deal and a lot less nerfy. Fleet added, They also came up with the idea of him flopping on the ground before the truck hits him. 
those little details make it great. Oh, this isn't domestic abuse, this is hilarious! Despite being invisible and getting killed off pretty early, the super cool Translucent makes a memorable impression. He mainly uses his power to be perhaps the world's most successful pervert. But he's also capable of stripping down for the ultimate sneak attack. Naked and unafraid, Translucent ambushes Huey at work. But after throwing out a few cheap shots, he's interrupted by Billy Butcher's speeding car. <laughs> Butcher and Translucent engage in a bloody fistfight until Huey exploits the soup's shocking weakness. No, literally being shot. The shots of Butcher ramming into the store acquired a duplicate set that the stunt coordinator rigged, complete with its own rail system and camera. Both were linked to a green wrecking ball on wires that was later edited out and replaced with Butcher's car. The setup was motion controlled so the team could repeat the movement, destroying the store as many times as they needed to until they got the perfect shot. Invisible actors are notoriously hard to find. Was Kevin Bacon unavailable? So, Butcher and Translucent's fistfight was filmed in multiple parts with some classic movie magic. First, they had to act out the choreographed fight with a stunt double in a mocap suit, who was later erased. After that, the actor repeated the entire fight by himself. I'm not supposed to talk about what that reminds me of. What the hell are you doing? Oh! As the brawl continues, Translucent ends up partially visible when Butcher spits blood on him. The team used a stunt double as an animation reference for the blood spatter, and also for when Translucent takes an electric shock straight to the ass. That would have taken me forever to work that one out. I don't think it's controversial to say that Homelander is kind of a dick. He's a toxic co-worker, a crappy dad, and he likes milk in all the wrong ways. Gross. He's also a homicidal maniac, but to the Vault Corporation, he's an important asset. Synergy! At the end of the first episode of The Boys, any possibility of Homelander being a crusader of justice goes down in flames when he assassinates the mayor of Baltimore and his son in their plane with his laser vision. To create this shocking scene, the crew filmed Homelander actor Anthony Starr hanging from wires in front of a green screen, then combined that footage with CGI to create the final effect. This technique also applies to basically every big budget superhero movie ever made. You'll believe a man can fly and brutally murder a child. Homelander uses his laser eyes throughout the show to do everything from killing cold blood to heat up his milk. And it was during the production of this particular scene that the visual effects team refined the look of his most memorable superpower. Stephen Fleet told befores and afters, there's also a lot of subtlety and a lot of breakup in those lasers that make them slightly unique from your average CG laser eye gag, and they play into his character. They say you can tell a lot about a person from their eyes. If they're glowing red, it probably means they're about to kill you. Well, hug your kids, right? Because you never know what might happen. Every superhero story needs to escalate in the sequel, except Ant-Man, apparently. I really want, like, a line. Right? So in season two of The Boys, the deep goes from flinging a dolphin to riding a whale. As is tradition, though, his animal companions always meet in fortunate ends. And poor Lucy is no exception. She takes a speedboat straight to the side, covering everyone around her in tons of blood and guts. Like that party in Blade, except way less singing and dancing. Gross. The shocking moment was conceptualized by writer Craig Rosenberg, who fought to bring it to the screen. Showrunner Eric Kripke told Entertainment Weekly, I think he specifically wanted to top the dolphin. I was initially reluctant, but he argued that there are only so many more times a deep can kill marine life through his sheer incompetence. The deep rides Lucy into the path of the boys' speedboat, hoping to force them to stop. Unfortunately, Butcher decides to speed up instead of slowing down impaling the whale and knocking the deep out cold. No, 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 don't floor it! Okay, floor it! As the visual effects team told Variety, the boat was pulled on a rail by a string into a model version of Lucy. Meanwhile, her entrails exploded out of cannons, spraying 150 gallons of fake blood onto several stunt doubles. Like that party in Wednesday, except way less singing and dancing. <laughs> Gross. The entire set was built by hand over the course of five months, with numerous crew members taking the time to painstakingly recreate a disemboweled whale carcass. This will harvest your blood. Don't the VFX supervisor Stephen Fleet revealed that there's only one blue screen shot in the entire sequence, and it's when the Deep is on the whale. Much like Aquaman is the king of Atlantis, the Deep is the king of getting aquatic mammals vaporized by vehicles. Have you ever had a migraine so bad it felt like your head was gonna explode? 
For some unlucky government officials in Season 2, that nightmare becomes a messy reality, starting with CIA Deputy Director Susan Raynor. During a congressional hearing about Compound V, it's not long before skulls start popping, scanner style. <laughs> C-SPAN is finally must-see TV! Speaking with Corridor Crew, Stephen Fleet revealed that much of the head explosion effect was developed in Season 1, when Translucent was taken out by a C4 suppository. A, a what now? <laughs> After that was designed, he got tipped off that there would be plenty more head explosions to come in future episodes. His technique required what the VFX team referred to as a blood lollipop. Gross. Which doubles as the actor's head and is used to drench anyone near the victim with fake blood. The computer graphics team then made a cranium model, filling in the larger chunks of brain and bone as they fly in multiple directions. Okay, someone else is doing the next boys video. Finally, the beheaded CGI body is given what Fleet calls the necklace, the meaty flap of skin that remains on the body. He bragged, this is one of my proudest accomplishments of season two from a supervision standpoint. It's okay. Just admiring the shape of your skull. This confirms what most people already knew. The Boys is a show for sickos by sickos. Oh, God! In season three of The Boys, it seems like the crew are finally going to find their ultimate weapon in the fight against Homelander. To their surprise, the weapon they discover is the powerful and problematic World War II hero known as Soldier Boy. You help me find the rest of my team, and I'll help you with this Homelander. With a patriotic name and the ability to level buildings with radioactive bursts, Soldier Boy is basically Captain America with a personality disorder and a nuke in his chest. He's also high out of his mind. In other words, this is the only guy on Earth who could feasibly take on Homelander, and fans couldn't wait to see it. You think you look strong? You're wearing a cape. No capes! The big battle finally took place late in Season 3, interrupting Herogasm, which is a massive superhero orgy. It's an intense brawl that interrupts some of the craziest sex acts you've ever seen, which is either a good thing or a bad thing depending on what you're into. But Soldier Boy doesn't fight Homelander alone. Huey and Butcher lend a hand, high on their own supply of Temp V. Stunt coordinator John Koyama took the lead in bringing to life a superhero fight for the ages. Stephen Fleet told Befores and Afters, he'd film it like a full-on movie. He'll shoot coverage, he'd send edits, he'd get notes. I think he did 12 to 16 versions of that sequence alone before we even filmed it. Many of the stunts involved a collection of wires and green screens, and the gaps were filled with computer graphics. The most challenging part of the sequence was, quote, getting that iconic shot of Butcher and Homelander hitting each other with lasers and finding the right balance between making it that thing that everybody knows in movies where two lasers hit each other, but not making it over the top because, well, that's not our show. As one of the boy's only good guy characters, Starlight's ability to project light couldn't be more symbolic. I am so sorry, are you alright? But bringing her powers to life takes a lot more than just setting off some fireworks. A season one showdown with A-Train took the VFX house Frame Store 8 several intense weeks of work. In an interview with Den of Geek, Framestore executive producer Christopher Gray revealed the real-world science behind the shining soup's powers. He explained, we looked at a thing called femtophotography, which is like a way of visualizing photons. He referred to a TED talk which describes the imaging as visualizing the world at one trillion frames per second. For non-science geeks, that's real slow. It's the tech you need to make the only camera fast enough to put A-Train in prison for exploding Huey's girlfriend. One of the boy's strangest turns is when Black Noir has visions of obscene cartoons committing shocking acts of violence to help him dig up repressed memories. The cartoon sequences were a fan-favorite addition to the series, but developing the hybrid scenes was a complicated process. There have been vast advancements in this type of technology since Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny made out. <coughs> the development and animation of the cartoon characters was done by Six Point Harness and Team In Between. Stephen Fleet told befores and afters, On set, we made cutouts to scale of the characters. All of them! I mean, my office was filled with cutouts of these cartoon characters. We would juggle popping them into frame for reference, lineup, sometimes even acting out character motions. I'm sure there's some really goofy dailies out there that someone could use to embarrass us. Hopefully it stays locked down because you definitely don't want footage out there of you doing this. <laughs> you motherfucker.
Behind the scenes, it turns out that making a fake version of the Avengers looks a lot like making the real version of the Avengers, or at least last minute reshoots against the green screen in an airplane hangar. Kevin Feige! A subplot featured throughout season 2 of The Boys is the development of a big crossover movie, Dawn of the Seven. The in universe flick even received a real world trailer, debuting as a meta teaser for season 3 of The Boys. VFX studio Rising Sun Pictures revealed much of the work that went into making this mock movie with a special making of Breakdown. Filming was completed on practical sets designed to simulate a city in ruins, including a broken down bus and the standard concrete rubble that every superhero movie is legally obligated to have. A green screen was used to add in the apocalyptic background, showing Vought Tower up in smoke. The end result somehow looks better than the Snyder Cut. You're welcome! Let's talk about the giant penis. Okay, maybe it's not giant, but perspective is everything, right fellas? The last scene we're talking about is pretty unforgettable. No matter how hard you try to erase it from your mind, it's not going anywhere. In the season 3 premiere called Payback, a size-shrinking super named Termite shrinks down so small that his entire body can fit on the head of a pin. Or the tip of a... We're not allowed to show it, and we can barely even say it. So just read between the lines. So Termite shrinks down for a trip into his partner's love tunnel. But while he's giving his mate the old reverse kidney stone, he accidentally sneezes and shoots back to normal size. For his boyfriend, this is nothing short of the apocalypse. Termite is left shocked and covered from head to toe in blood. The craziest thing about this scene might be where they got the idea. Turns out the writers saw all those memes about Ant-Man beating Thanos by crawling up his butt to go big mode. You hear that internet? This was literally your fault. What's funnier than this scene is what the set looked like when they shot it. Using a mix of practical effects, Kevin, and CGI. The props that Termite uses needed to be supersized, including the tube he climbs inside. In an interview with Befores and Afters, the effects supervisor Stephen Fleet revealed, the arts department built a practical penis entrance set, an 11 foot high, 30 foot longish representation of the penis. The practical entrance was key for the performer to do his fantastic and very real swan dive. One of the biggest challenges for the team turned out to be the climactic explosion. They used CGI for the big moment, though a blood bag was also used for reference. But honestly, they could have done it any way they liked. No one knows what this is supposed to look like. It's never happened before, right? Don't answer that. I don't want to know. 